We are live. Hi, um, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the second episode of uh, Adult TD and Friends. Uh, I am, if you don't know, Kevin Harris. Hello, good to see you. Um, so episode two, um, I'm going to read out the, the title of this, um, is Curiosities About How the Brain Works and How We Subconsciously Categorize Our Surroundings and Correlations to Mental Health and Psychological Wellbeing. <laughs> which I think is also the name of the new Borat movie. <laughs> so, I wouldn't um, be surprised. Our, we've got very special guests tonight. Um, <laughs> so our, our guests are Linda Rising and uh, Gitta Klidgard. <laughs> almost, almost fell. Um, so first of all, do you want to just say hi? Um, and uh, where are you today? Linda. So my name is Linda Rising. I am in Nashville, Tennessee. For those of you who might not have ever been here, that is Music City, USA. And even in the time of COVID, we have music 24 seven. And that includes three garage bands that I direct that meet once a week in our garage. And we just had a performance on Sunday. So the music goes on. Nice. So I'm um, actually in, in England at the moment, because I'm in England, it's seven o'clock in the evening. What, what time have you got over there, Linda? It is just a little bit after 1 p.m. So 1300. Nice. I get that. Where are you? Uh, who are you? Uh, oh, who am I? That's a big question. Well, so my name is Gide Klitka. Um, I am currently in Stockholm, um, where I have now finally probably moved to after kind of being on my way here for a long time. Um, but this year I actually moved here properly and registered and hopefully soon I will also have a bank account. <laughs> um, uh, so things are moving. Um, yeah. Do you also want to know what we do or do we yes. want to figure that out later? Yes. What what time have you got actually? Um, let, let's start and just kind of... Um, I got 8 p.m. in the evening. Okay. So do you want to give both of you, give yourselves a brief introduction of of how you see yourself and, and what you do? Gita, you, you go first. Hmm. Well, I see myself as... Well, I call myself an agile coach, I would say. Um, I do a lot of things. I see myself as someone who helps people be better at collaborating, um, but also help people feel more comfortable at being who they are, which can benefit them as individuals and our organizations because we get so much more out of having individuals instead of small clones trying to be the same. Yeah, so I work with safety, communication, agile, and everything. Nice. Okay, well, we'll talk quite a lot about it, I think, today. <laughs> um, how do you describe yourself? So I'm retired. Yes. And, and that means I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and so I look at lots of interesting topics that most people don't have the time or the energy or maybe even the interest to look at. And I try to make the connection between those things. Some of them are pretty difficult. And what we actually do in that agile world, because we need some more connection, I think, to science and evidence and we just don't have either the resources or the interest to do those experiments that investigation so we should look around and see what others who are doing real science who have evidence to share and what we can learn from them so I try to be a gateway. Nice. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, 
ask because this is this is kind of an unusual realm fortunately it's getting less unusual but um in the development world this, this isn't kind of something you kind of go to university and think right this is what i want to do with my life so can i ask how you kind of got to um want to be a be a part of the kind of the psychological side of of development and it and how we work together how did what drew you into that are you asking me yes yeah, sorry linda yes <laughs> okay <laughs> okay <laughs> It was by accident. I didn't plan on it. I certainly wasn't interested in the psychological aspects. But when I started writing the book on fearless change, patterns for introducing new ideas with Mary Lynn Manns, I thought, well, those are going to be technical things. I needed to know what sort of technical information would convince people what kind of technical argument I would have to make in order to talk to developers about using patterns or any new idea. I thought it was all going to be about some sort of evidence-based approach, and I just needed to learn what those approaches were. And in writing that book, which, by the way, took us 10 years, <laughs> I became a different person. I started out as a very technical person. I have a PhD in computer science. And by the time we had finished that book, all of a sudden I realized there was a lot I didn't know. And that if you wanted to influence people, if you wanted to convince them that your idea was a good one, you were going to have to understand much more than the technical area you were dealing in you had to understand influence, social psychology, evolutionary biology, and I knew absolutely nothing about any of those. So it was a long journey that 10 years, and along the way, well, I came out a different person. Nice. So in order to do that, Linda, did you have to convince people that that was a thing for you to be doing to go and do that research well you know my husband often asks me uh, since i have been retired now for 20 years he says linda why are you still doing this <laughs> and my answer is simple i'm still trying to convince myself because i know how hard it is for people to realize that they're not logical decision makers. They don't look at the evidence. It doesn't matter whether you're a technical person or not. We make our decisions for other reasons, not because we're convinced by some scientific experiment, collection of facts, evidence. Our decisions are made for other reasons. And if we want to be influential, we have to understand what those other reasons are. Uh, I think we'll kind of explore quite a lot of that, I think, tonight. Um, Gitta, um, for you, what, what led you on, on this path um, that you've kind of got to this point in your career and this side of, of development? I'm actually going to steal Linda's answer because it was an accident. <laughs> um, I started out wanting to be a network engineer. My big dream was actually to work for Cisco uh, or work for Sun Microsystems in uh, Ireland so I could learn a little bit of Gaelic. Mm -hmm. um, and I came out and I started out as a very technical tester and started realizing that by having a good process, we could build in quality instead of looking to see if it was there at the end. Um, so I became interested in processes and I realized that I'm very, very good at understanding a complicated process and then make it into something simple that you can actually kind of relate to and use. Because we can have the most perfect process and if nobody can relate to it, nobody's going to use it. Um, so that's kind of how I started with processes and became a little bit interested in Agile. Um, and then 
one of the role models I had was this old lady who kept coming to conferences and talking about influence um, and stuff like that. Um, so I was lucky enough to be a volunteer at a different conference, the go-to conferences, for many years. And um, it was used to be called Joe because of Java. Um, and Linda came, and um, I can't remember when I met her the first time, but I remember um, that after like five minutes, we were already talking about how to do retrospectives, and we did a further, a further together. And I think I took Linda's... Um, influencing patterns uh, workshop or tutorial seven times now um, because every single time you I can learned teach it. you could teach it Dita. I probably could by now now so one of the things I realized more and more is that it's not really about processes it's about connections it's about people um, and I think maybe because I felt unsafe a big part of my life I've always been working on safety and then in 2017, I heard the TED talk by Amy Edmondson and realized there's something called psychological safety. And it's a lot of what I've been trying to do as well. And I was lucky enough to be in an organization that said, um, we would like to focus on this. So I was able to dive into it and, and work on it as well. Um, so kind of like I've gradually come from Oh, everyone should just do Scrum because it's nice and structured and orderly. <laughs> um, and we have nice little boxes, which I really like, to kind of embracing the messiness of people and systems and, yeah, the whole thing about relations and influencing and uh, looking into how our brain works. And I very much appreciate a lot of what Linda does because I don't have – or maybe I don't take the time to read all those things and I don't understand all of it. So she kind of digests this and then we have interesting conversations about it or I meet when I meet at a conference. Um, of course, other people also influence it, but Linda is my big role model um, and she knows that. Um, um, we've known each other for maybe 15 years now or something. Yes, long time. I remember the years he, I turned 40, she turned 70, and every time we were at the same conference, Linda would go, Gita and I are getting old this year. <laughs> yeah. So I, I should interject and say I am now in my last year of 70s. Yeah, we'll get old. So next my year. next birthday, I will leave the 70s wow. behind. Yeah, I'm leaving the 40s behind. I yes I I have <laughs> I see my last forties. <laughs> but the, the bonus the bonus of being that old is uh, I did get my my vaccine a couple of weeks ago, so there there are <laughs> there are good things about getting old. Yes. <laughs> um. So one of the things we've kind of mentioned already is about how messy people are and how how we kind of lie to ourselves and how we. We make decisions that that aren't really based on well real life or anything sensible. Um, so I was wondering, first of all, we we obviously do that for a reason. It's part of kind of how we've evolved into this state. So how though now do we see what what's a useful lie that we tell ourselves and what what's a a harmful lie that we tell ourselves? Linda. So it, it's it's all useful. Because we have all of these biases and flaws in our thinking because at one time they meant survival. And most of the time, most of the time, they work well. They got us where we are today. And if we were to get rid of all of them, we would be in trouble. So one of our very strong biases is that of deferring to authority. We all have it, and Gita knows about it because it's one of the influence strategies, an appeal to authority. Someone we respect, it could be a person who is in authority because of their position in the hierarchy. If you were in the military, for instance, someone who outranked you, would be someone who had authority over you. If you live in a country that has a government, 
than the high ranking officials in that government or the police in that uh, government are people who have authority over you and we defer to them. We are influenced by them. We do what they say. We follow their advice or leadership. If we didn't have that, if we questioned every single decision, not following authority. Right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. We should be listening to, in this case, people who have authority in the field of immunology, the research scientists who study vaccines, the historians who have looked at pandemics in the past. If we don't look to authority, then our decisions about how we should behave, whether we should get the vaccine or not. And by the way, I've had both of my shots and so has my husband and so have all the members of all our garage bands. So we are happy about that. If we didn't defer to authority, if we didn't realize that people who know something or in a position of authority over us, if they didn't see something that we didn't understand, then we would have total anarchy and our decisions would be terrible. So it's not that some biases are better or worse, it's that they are all good most of the time, but every now and then, it's not a good idea to just take a step, make a decision because someone we think is in a position of authority tells us what to do. And there is no better example of that than the president we had from 2016 until the end of 2020, who said about this pandemic, oh, it's nothing. It's just like a cold. Don't worry about it. Someone who gave very bad advice to a lot of people in the United States who still believe that because they recognized him as an authority when he knew nothing about the pandemic and he himself didn't recognize the experts around him who were telling him what he should be doing about this pandemic. So he led 50% of the people in the United States astray who still even now refuse to get the vaccine because they believe there are dangers involved in the vaccine, whereas this virus is just like a cold or flu. I was so of course, all these biases, they can lead us astray, but most of the time, they are there for a good reason. We evolved to have this behavior. It kept us alive. It meant survival. I also think that knowing about them is what helps us. I mean, so one of the quotes I have on my web page is, if you're very strong, you must be very nice, which is <laughs> from, one of, it's from one of the P.P. Long st stocking books. Um, ah. And like Spider-Man, it's, you know, with great power come, comes great responsibility. Because as authority figures, which we are, I think all of us are in some constellation, like when I go into an organization as a consultant, by default, I know more because I'm the outside expert. And that also means that I need to be aware of that responsibility and be aware about what uh, what I do and what I say. Um, and the same when we learn about the other biases, by becoming aware of some of them, becoming aware of the influence, we can use those to do good. We can use those to, I mean, we can even use it to cheat our own brains if, if we want to influence ourselves. That's what I find the most fascinating. Um, like one of the things <laughs> that's also in the influencing is about if there's someone you don't like, do something for them. Because your brain will go, 
oh, I thought I didn't like him, but now I did something nice for him, so maybe I do like him anyway. So we can actually use our knowledge about these things to kind of help our brain into moving where we want to go. So it's not that they are bad. And like, like Linda said, we are here because we survived. Um, our brain is, is there for survival. And it's not that long ago, even the, when we look at the time of the earth, where if there was a danger, we had to react to it. Otherwise, we would die. If there was a reward, you know, we, we might be able to eat the next day. So we wait, react a lot stronger to danger as well. And that's something we can work on, we can start reframing, but we need to be aware that this is how it is before we can do anything about it. So how, how do the technological advancements that we see now, how can we use those to kind of help us go in the right direction and help us make those choices that would have been more instinctive in the past? Gitta, do... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think one of the things we can do is we can help people who might not be able to travel. While I totally prefer conferences live uh, with people around me, um, it also means that some people who cannot afford traveling can now get more knowledge online because they can go to a conference, sometimes even for free because it's online. So we can use the technology to help those who are less privileged than ourselves. And I think that uh, that's something I see as my responsibility, not because I have to, because, but because I think it's the right thing to do is to help those who have less privilege than me. I mean, I might lack some privilege because I'm a woman. I think I'm lucky enough to not tweet about too technical stuff so usually I don't get harassed and um, I'm only up to one death threat by now. So that's pretty good for women in tech. Um, but on the other hand, I'm white. I have a good pay. I eat every day. Um, I am straight, which means that no matter where I go, I am allowed to have my love. Um, I can use all of these things or I can, that the fact that I am ahead on all of these things means I can help those who are not. And I think technology to some extent can help us, but it can also go the other way. Like one of the things we see, for instance, um, is that like some of the facial recognitions doesn't recognize black people. One of my friends can't go to the automatic uh, passport control in Barcelona at night because it keeps telling her to stand in front of the the, the screen because she's mm. black so it, it can't tell her so while technology can help us we we also put in all the biases that we have so Linda, do you, how how do you use technology to kind of help advance where we're going to where we're going to go and how we can make those decisions so i'm going to build on what gita said because i like those answers. The first one, as a musician, especially, what I've seen is, is two important, I'm going to call them bright spots, from the work of Chip and Dan Heath, who said, even in the midst of chaos, if you're trying to make a transformation in an organization, and you're very discouraged, you don't see any progress at all, look for these little tiny lights in the middle of the darkness, they will always be there. And as bad as it's been, and it has been bad, I have friends who have died. I don't wanna make light of all the horrible things that have happened to people over this past year. But at the same time, there are so many bright spots and most of them have to do with technology. So I have lots of friends, as Gita mentioned, who would never have been able to go either to a technical conference or in my case, a musical workshop. They didn't have the time, they didn't have the money. They wouldn't have been able to travel, spend the money for a hotel room, 
But now, for a very small amount of money, they can go online and they can study with some of the greatest musicians in the world. They can take classes, they can learn new techniques, they can become acquainted with the repertoire of a certain period they're interested in. They would never have been able to do that before. So now the whole music sphere is so much more open than it was to people who might not be the best musicians in the world, but who love it. And now it's much more inclusive. It brings people in, it gets rid of some of the discrimination. Instead of just attracting the people who have the money and the time, now anyone for $25 can log into a Zoom workshop with an expert on Renaissance music and have an opportunity that was just never there before. And of course, we're also seeing that in technical events as well, just like this one, for either nothing or a very small amount of money, you can spend time hearing from the thought leaders, the people that you'd like to know more about, topics that you could be interested in, but maybe didn't know anything about. You can do that all day long if you want. You can do it in the middle of the night because we know there are time differences. I remember recently being at a conference and looking around the room, so to speak, and here was a fellow from Japan, and I said, what time is it for you? And he said, it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I thought, well, okay. So he elected, it was his option, to wake up at three o'clock in the morning so that he could come to this conference. Now, if he would traveled, it would have been the equivalent of three o'clock in the morning. He would have just been suffering severe jet lag. But those opportunities now are astounding. I never cease to be amazed at it. And that's true in every domain in which I participate, music, tech, I'm also politically active. We can have political meetings. And the first thing people say is, if I'd had to drive to Nashville, I would never have come to this meeting. But all I have to do is click on this link and I'm there. So we have more political participation because we have the connection. Just what Gita has been saying, this technology allows us to connect. We, we have been so focused on the downsides of it that we don't realize what enormous numbers of bright spots there are. So let me also address the second thing she said that facial recognition and a lot of AI is biased. It is, but so are people. In fact, that's where the bias comes from. And what we would hope is we haven't had much success with straight coding in the past. If a developer, for instance, has to create an algorithm, a step-by-step -step set of instructions for a computer to do something like facial recognition, or there's a lot now in the medical field, analysis of x-rays, diagnoses of cancer, for instance. When you require that step-by-step -step analysis, the result is never very good. What we have to move toward is what's called neural nets that learn. And the hope is that the computer will be smarter and will learn on its own to objectively evaluate a face, an x-ray, determine a cancer diagnosis, that it will move beyond human bias. And now that's the trend, and I'm very hopeful about it. In the beginning, I was not, and now I am more positive 
or hopeful because the computer is learning on its own and on its own without the step-by-step instructions from a biased programmer, it on its own can learn from objective feedback. Like, is that cancer? Am I diagnosing that x-ray correctly? And we'll get better going forward. They're already better than people. People, that's where the bias is. <laughs> We're loaded with it. <laughs> it's, it's like when you go to the doctors and um, you see the doctor open up Google and start looking up your symptoms. And you <laughs> think, well, that's obviously not a good doctor. But then again, otherwise you just go in and you expect the doctor to have memorized every single disease there is. To yes. It's, it's... It, it, exactly. And it's not that the doctors aren't smart and it's not that we don't need the doctors. But in all the experiments that have been done with algorithms that look, say, at x-rays for presence or absence of nodules that might or might not be lung cancer, the algorithms are better. The doctors are not only biased, but they'll, when shown the same x-ray, separated by a few minutes say they're not consistent doctors can have a bad day maybe they're not paying attention maybe they didn't get enough sleep last night well that's not true for the algorithm the algorithm is consistent that's why it can learn it identifies the same thing in the same way from the same x-ray every single time I don't know about you. I hope I never have to have that question answered, but I just soon have the computer say, yes, you have lung cancer. Or, no, you don't have lung cancer. Um, I think what, one of the things you mentioned there is, is about the kind of the, the, the future of, of where we're going to go with, with these systems and the neural nets and things. How do you, how do you see our roles evolving? in those situations uh gita what's your what's your opinion well i kind of feel a little bit like our roles are evolving now i i see more people becoming conscious about what they're participating in for instance um i remember i saw this great talk by martin fowler once which was called not just code monkeys and one of the things was about taking responsibility also for what we participate in. And he said, not a single piece of dark code end up online except somebody's typing it. And I see people, more and more people are now starting to consider this, making a deliberate choice about what kind of company do I want to work for? What kind of stuff do I want to help produce? And yes, there's still a lot out there. Um, I mean, algorithms that are meant to cheat you when you go into a page so that you buy more. There's a lot of that going on, but I do see more and more people responding to this. And again, I think it's also because um, we are getting more resources as a society because if you don't have any money and the only job you can get is creating nuclear weapons, you're probably gonna take that job so you can feed your children. If you can say, you know what, I'm just gonna find another job. It is, even though that you can't get that right away, I think a lot of us are still, we still have the privilege that we can do so. And that also allows us to take that step back and say, okay, so what am I contributing to? So I do have hope in that because I'm seeing this more and more. I see some good talks about ethics in what we do, but I also see people making choices like um, saying no to a company because they don't believe in what they do. And it's not that we should all, you know, we're not all saints and it's not like we can all do amazingly good stuff, but I think that at least make a decision. I think that that will help us um, also in the future to make better things. Um, so we're, we're kind of talking uh, a lot about the IT side of it, but 
on the, on the conscious side, on how the brain works, um, you mentioned earlier, Gitta, about the ways of, of reprogramming uh, yourself. Um, how how many times have you done that, and what benefits has that has that given you? Well, so one of the things that I have actually reprogrammed is to become a little bit more positive. Um, I used to be very, very negative about everything, and sometimes I still fall back in that trap. Um, but like when I was working at IBM and I was actually working on location um, and before I became a consultant for them, I would take this little walk. It was like 10 minutes to walk to work. And I started taking breaks there because there was this old couple who had this amazing garden. Like they would have different flowers depending on what time of the year it was and stuff. And I started taking the time to stop and notice if there were any new flowers or, you know, just take a deep breath. Um, and slowly, slowly, stuff like that, for instance, building that focus on the good things uh, helped me feel better and and um, um, and be more positive in general. And I remember I was at, I um, can't remember, I was somewhere at a gathering and one of the other participants said, I love how we always find the positive in things. <laughs> and I took a step back and like in time, I didn't do it like act uh, physically, but in time my head I was like, whoa, <laughs> That's when I realized how much I had actually changed. Because I used to be able to uh, find the bad thing in everything. You know, what's the bad thing about this? And I can still do this, um, which also means I'm very good at anticipating risks. But I can also find the good in a lot of things. And, and that have been part of active um, kind of reprogramming myself. Um, another is to ac accept compliments. Uh, if I'm in a bad place, I can't, but moving from always when somebody said something nice to me, I'll be like, oh, it's nothing. That's just my work. You know, everyone else could do this better into taking steps. And then, first of all, I started by saying it in my head. Then I my next step was to be quiet in my head. And then my next step was to say thank you. And then slowly starting to integrate it in my head. And again, I still fall back and I can very much see like, what is my mental state if I'm at a bad place? I can, still can't take it in. But if, if I'm in my normal state, I can actually now take compliments and go like, oh, they really like that. Um, and sometimes I can even go, yeah, that's true. That was a good thing. Um, but it, it's, it took like, I, I don't know, three, four years to actually get even to the point where I could just say thank you. So Linda, um, I'm trying to put this in a, in a delicate way. So e even now, do you do you look to see how you can you change your own behavior and reprogram yourself? Is that still something for you to do? Well, you're asking me if I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so She's the moving. answer is I'm not dead yet. And the only people I know who are not interested in changing or learning, making progress, getting better, are the people who are not alive. So I'm definitely still alive. I plan to be alive for quite a while. And I do practice that. And what Gita is saying is exactly what the scientific evidence shows about improving, about learning. And the first thing she mentioned was taking a break. Mm -hmm. So we can only work using our system too, if we wanted to take a little foray into the work of Daniel Kahneman, consciously using system two, we only have 45 minutes. And after that, if we don't take a break, then system two will do it for us you'll find that you're thinking about something else, your mind is wandering, you can no longer focus on the problem you were solving or the book you were reading or the podcast you were listening to. You just don't have the ability to do that. 
So by learning how to take advantage of that, because there's nothing you can do about it, that's a 45 minute limit, by consciously programming that in as Gita did to say, I will, I will take a break. I will look around. I will go outside. We know that we do a much better job of thinking, problem solving, making decisions, coming up with innovative ideas. When we are outside, when our minds are not focused, when we're just looking at the flowers or the trees, or in my case, I have a trail that goes by my house and we have wild turkeys and owls and foxes and being out there, I know, and now there's evidence for it, gives you a chance to come up with new ideas. And then she had a list of things that she did that were in the nature of an experiment. Well, I don't know whether this will work. I'm gonna try telling myself that this is a good thing. I'm gonna try saying thank you. I'm gonna to try to incorporate that into the way I behave. Those were all little tiny steps, little experiments. We talk about that in an agile development cycle, but we should also apply that in our own lives. You should always be trying something new, even just some small thing. Every day, some little thing, taking that break, going outside, looking around, thinking about the world in a different way, looking for bright spots. And then she's taking all the information that she got from that wonderful influence class and she's trying to do it to herself by saying, if somebody is telling me, thank you, I know there's a little protocol here that we all wanna go through that. If somebody tells us something nice, we all wanna say, oh, it was nothing. I was just doing my job. That's universal around the world. We all want to say, oh, oh, it's okay. I'm, I'm not special. I didn't really do anything extra. And for the person who took the time to tell you, to appreciate what you did, to hear you say, oh, it was nothing, doesn't make them feel very good. And it really doesn't make you feel very good either. So maybe if nobody takes anything else away from this whole session, it would be to try to do what Gita experimented with. If someone compliments you, to just say thank you. Try that as an experiment. And then to yourself say, they really meant it. They were saying something nice about me. I should try to incorporate that instead of denigrating it. I can use that, build on that, learn from that, be better. One of the things I do, I actually also <laughs> learn from Linda, is I write it down by hand. Uh, <laughs> because our brain somehow takes it in differently when we write stuff down by hand. So when somebody gives me a compliment, uh, something that stands out, I write it down by hand because I have, um, I have a Chinese box. Um, my grandfather sailed the seas <laughs> as a ship's captain and he brought home this little wooden chest from China um, that my mom inherited and I inherited from her. And I use that um, to put these notes in, um, as well as we've been using very much in the Agile community in Germany, using appreciation cards that we write something nice on and give to someone. Because not only can it be hard to say that, it can also be hard to receive it. So those I have in my box. Um, so I can look at this. And it's actually quite funny once you see these things and you go like, not only is it nice, because you can look at what people did, but you kind of get, you get brought back to the situation. And you go like, oh, this was so much fun in this. Um, 
Like the first time I did improv, and my my now friend Daniel came up to me. He only knew me from Twitter, and he's like, "You really are crazy. It's not just something you pretend on Twitter." <laughs> and, um, and we've now been really good friends for six or seven years. And like you know, I get reminded of this when I look at his thank you note from 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 this session, um, and all handwritten. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to throw in just. I have a I have a practice of saving emails i have a folder in my e email program called keep and when someone sends me an email after an event or after i've done something when they say oh linda this is really great thank you for that and i i really enjoy that but i put it in the keep folder and then every now and then if i'm having a bad day or things are not going so well in the world or I'm discouraged. I just randomly go through that keep folder and I pull up all those very nice compliments. And once in a while, I will even reply to that to say, you know, you sent me this a year ago or five years ago and I'm rereading it. And it just helped me get through the day and it makes another connection that probably that person never anticipated. I just exchanged one of those on the 10 year anniversary of the Fukushima earthquake in Japan. When I went over to talk at a conference and then I got so much email after that from the people in Japan and replying to them and then hearing back from them 10 years later, it brought it all back, what it was like, how terrified they were and how happy they were that I took the time and energy to fly all the way to Japan when they were still having aftershocks. I, I kept asking myself, what am I doing? Oh my God, the hotel is shaking. But to be there for them, and now 10 years later, it all comes back, just like you said, Gita, it's a way of reliving that. That's a <laughs> highlight in my life that I'll never forget because I have all that email to remind me. So yes, writing it down and having a real object somehow to go back and look and remember make sure that we don't forget all those highlights. I had a, a manager um, who who left me a handwritten note after a meeting. It was a hard meeting, but um, I kind of got through it okay. And she left me this handwritten note on my desk when I got back to my desk. Um, and it was just completely out of the blue. Um, but I've still got it now. And I still use it as a bookmark in one of the books I've got on the side, just because it's, it's it's feeling appreciated. It's having that kind of interaction with your colleagues and actually feeling like you're you're making a difference in in what you're doing to other people. So the flip side is is giving compliments to other people. It's not just how you take the the, the compliments yourself, but how you give them and what that means to the other person is is, is really important. Yeah, and I well, let me throw in a, a little bit of scientific evidence for this as well. The work of James Pennebaker showed, and I, I was talking about this at the beginning of the pandemic, that writing about how you're feeling going through this terrible experience is there's evidence that it shows the benefit of just taking a real pen or pencil and a real pad of paper and putting down what you're feeling without any thought of organization, not any thought of sharing this with anybody, just your thoughts, what you're going through, how you feel about it, what you think the world will be like in a month, in a year. That is definitely helpful for your psyche. We know that we're hardwired to work with real objects. We know our ancestors sat in caves and made drawings on the walls. 
that were stories about how they were feeling and what adventures they had. So this is a deeply hardwired trait we have to put something on a real piece of paper about what we feel, about what we're going through, and it has psychological benefits. It's not a 100% cure for depression, but by doing it on successive days, I recommend the work of James Pennebaker because he's been studying this now for decades. It's just the power of a real expression, not an email, real piece of paper and a real pencil. I've been doing it myself. Um, so how, how do we encourage our colleagues then? If, if we have colleagues who are, are struggling or going through a, a hard time, how, how do we encourage them to be able to make these steps? Gita. Well, first of all, what I try to do is listen to them. Um, because I think that's part of something we forget sometimes. We listen a lot to be able to respond. Um, but sometimes just listening helps a lot as well. And then once we've listened to them, um, we can start talking to them about other tools they can use. I actually recommended uh, Penna Baker to one of my friends after listening to him and saying, I don't know if this will help you, but I just saw this talk from Linda about it. Um, and it sounds like something that might be able to help you. Um, but first of all, what I, what I try to do is to be present for them. Um, and I think sometimes we underestimate the value of that, just being there and letting them speak or letting them not speak. Be comfortable with that silence of them not speaking while we're with them. It's not as easy online, but it's not impossible. So I'm a part of an organization called Braver Angels. I joined in 2016 after the election because I didn't know what else to do. And in the workshops that Braver Angels holds, that is exactly what we do. You have to sit and have a conversation with somebody who's on the other side of the political spectrum, someone who doesn't agree with you on the really important issues, things that you deeply care about. This is a person who takes the opposite stance. And what we tend to do in a situation like that, whether we're in the same organization or in the same country, is we denigrate those people and say, well, they must be stupid. They don't agree with me about any of these important issues. So therefore, there must be something wrong with them. They must be stupid or ignorant or they don't really care. And when you have to, when you really have to sit and listen to what this person on the other side is really saying and listen with an open mind and an open heart, they don't necessarily change their minds, but you change. Because now you realize, well, this is a person who came from a different background, but this is a person who also cares about his family, about his country, about our future. He doesn't agree with me on these issues, but that doesn't mean that I can't listen to him and that I can't learn something about my own attitude that maybe I have changed by hearing what he has to say. Some of the hardest conversations I've had in the last four years have been at Braver Angels meetings. I thought I was pretty good at facilitation. I thought I was pretty good at talking to people who didn't agree with me, but I have learned an enormous amount. And it's been a wonderful experience. I wouldn't trade it. I, I think that's one of the things about psychological safety is that 
we do tend to think about our own psychological safety and, and it's very hard to think actually, am I affecting somebody else's? So um, Gitta, what, what, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that's very true. So one of the things I do in my trainings uh, on psychological safety is I ask people some questions because sometimes it can be too fluffy to talk about psychological safety. So I ask questions about um, so having them two and two so it's safer to talk about it, about, you know, when they felt safe. Um, I talk about when they felt unsafe, when they, um, what they do to make other people feel unsafe. And then the, the hardest question, I think, is, what do you do that might make other people feel unsafe? Uh, and that's something, so I've been doing these things with my friend Morgan, and that's something we can see people react really strongly to. Um, and what we also then do is we come up with an example ourselves because to show them that it's okay, because the instinct reaction is, I don't do that. I don't do anything to make other people do unsafe. But like one of the things I'm very uh, eager on when I'm, for instance, having retrospectives or other places where we have action points is to actually have a deadline or a follow up date uh, and to have somebody who is, depending on what it is, if it's for the whole team, an anchor person who kind of reminds the team, hey, remember, we agreed mm -hmm. on this. Or if it's something done by one person having a responsible. And when I ask about that, a lot of people hear, how fast can you do this? When actually what I'm asking is what would be a realistic time to do this? But it can be scary also, again, because often I am the consultant asking them for a deadline and they're used to this authority. When an authority asks for a deadline, it means how fast can you do this? Um, so that's one of the things. And another thing is that because I almost always seem confident, I might not always be it. Some people are afraid to speak when I'm there, because I know everything, apparently. Um, so showing people that there are these things that I do that make other people uh, feel unsafe can help them think about what do I do? Oh, maybe when I'm looking at some code, maybe the answer I'm giving might not be helpful for the other one. Maybe it makes them feel scared. Um, and then that's how we can start the discussion. And then I think the other part of it is that we need to remember that psychological safe does not mean always being comfortable. It's also about creating an environment where we can be uncomfortable because we want to be able to make mistakes and that's not always going to be comfortable, but it has to be safe. It has to be something we can do. Or um, I remember when I was, I think, oh, okay, I just realized how long ago this was. 15 years ago, <laughs> when I was being examined for cancer, which I luckily didn't have. Um, but um, starting to cry and having my teammates there who felt really, really uncomfortable with me crying, but still were there for me. And when I went to kind of get the result, three of them called me at home to offer to drive me there so I wouldn't be alone. Um, so that was so safe, but it was very uncomfortable for me to cry like that and uncomfortable for them. So I think that's a good example also of that. So I think well, that's a long thing about, yes, we can do stuff that makes other people feel unsafe and we need to be aware of that. Um, but we also need to learn that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And the, the thing that's often missing in most conversations is humility realizing that i may have strong views or opinions or experience about anything but i could be wrong i've seen what i've seen i've read what i've read i've heard what i've heard i grew up with the environment i had i didn't choose that my parents the location where in the world where I was born, what kind of education I mostly had. That's all I know. And I didn't choose most of it. So I could be wrong. And what I need to do is listen to you, share what I know. So humility and the other element that's often missing is curiosity. Yes. So how do you feel? 
what do you think about this? And oh, I see you disagree with me, but how did you come to be there? Tell me what you really think about that. So not much humility these days, not much curiosity. We've made up our minds. We don't listen to those other people. We don't share. It comes right back to what Gita started this conversation with was collaboration, cooperation. It's all about people. And we get all these amazing experiences when we're curious. So I was just in Denmark and stayed in a hotel for a bit uh, in isolation until I got the second Corona test showing I didn't have it. Um, and I talked with people in the reception because, you know, and they actually gave me a tour of the water. They have like this thing with pools and slides and everything, which is closed right now. And she was like, would you like to get a tour of this? <laughs> All because, you know, I've been curious and talking a bit to her and about, we actually found out that our dads had a birthday within a week because we were talking about, uh, because they just opened up vaccination of my dad and her dad and, you know, um, so I also find that curiosity not only helps us like get better workplaces, but it gives us so many amazing experiences. Um, yeah. yeah. I think maybe this, like, this even works with your spouse. <laughs> I have to practice, you know, because I'm old. It takes me a long time to get better. And so the first person I usually practice on is my husband. And when I began reading about the power of curiosity and humility, then I was talking to him about something and I said, well, how is it that you feel that? Or, you know, I'm really curious. And he looked at me and he said, what have you been reading? <laughs> You've been reading some articles about experiments, and I thought, okay, well, maybe it's not such a good idea to practice. <laughs> I, I am. I'm going to ask you both one last question. And I think it's probably as we both, we both we've gone over the 45 minutes, so I'm sure, not sure anybody's still concentrating on what we're saying. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So I just want to check what what is next what is next for the pair of you what 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 ambition do you want to kind of uh, cross off the the list next uh, Linda what, what what's your next thing that you want to you want to do So actually I just I have the, uh, folders of topics I'm working on and the one I just started is a real is probably for me the strangest of any of the topics. So this might be a good time to answer this question. I don't know, but it's about forests and trees. So there's some new research that suggests that trees can have a conversation mm -hmm. in a sense and that they share and cooperate. So by that, I mean, if one tree really needs a certain mineral, can send out a signal to the trees around it and the other trees will help that tree by sending it extra supplies of that mineral. It, the, the whole idea is so astounding that I, I still have to read the research, but it, it, the more of it that comes out, the more amazing it is. And the part I really liked was what happens to the old trees when the old trees die they fall to the bottom of the forest and they can deliberately send all their nutrients to help the young trees the trees that need the support and that visual was so powerful for me as i approach 80 to think i love that I'm going to think of myself now as an old tree that wants to help all the young seedlings in the forest. But I'm not quite ready to make a talk out of it yet or a project, so I'm just doing my research. But spent, I spent so much time with trees this past year that it was astounding to me to learn that they, they cooperate and collaborate is that too weird that, no. that's weird enough 
That's perfectly weird. You too. Well, you once said to me, Linda, I am known for doing the weird talk of the conference. I think it was after your Bonobo talk. Um, uh, well, actually, once I was given the compliment that that was a weird talk. You might become like Linda at some point, <laughs> which I think was a great compliment. Well, my next experience is in 10th of May, I am starting as an engineering manager and coach. So for the first time in my in my life, my career, I will actually have people reporting to me. Wow. And I'm very excited about it and I'm also a little bit terrified about it because it's a different kind of responsibility. And yeah. it's also not people who choose me. Usually when I coach people and help mm. people grow, mm. they choose to do this. Um so that's interesting, but um, I'm looking very much forward to it. Uh, so I'll be working for, um, some of you might know it, Mentimeter. Some of you use Mentimeter, um, which I actually haven't used very much. But uh, um, but you will. <laughs> I will. I will. I will learn about it. Um, um, what I really like about it is that a lot of the things I normally have to convince people to do uh, or even look to consider, they already were looking at. They are working very much on, on diversity and inclusion um, and not just diversity, let's have some good numbers, but actually looking into this. Uh, so like one of the questions I asked them, so the pictures you have on your job site, is that actually people who work for you or is it just to look good? Mm. Um, and it was actually people who, who, who work for them, but also like stuff like humility, being humble about what we do. Um, talking about mental health openly, um, taking responsibility when they make mistakes, like one of them forgot to call me. Um, <laughs> so he apologized very much the next day, but he didn't, what do you call it? There's a difference between kind of excusing it, making like, oh, it was, I couldn't help it. He took responsibility for it and said, I'm really sorry. I totally forgot about it until it was too late. So that kind of thing. So I'm looking very much forward to that. And one of the things I hope I will help them with is to keep all of these things as they grow, which they're doing at the moment. Good. So that's the next exciting adventure for me. Awesome. That sounds great. Oh, I think we need to do a plug, by the way, an advertisement. Linda and I will both be keynoting in Chicago next year, in case you didn't read that right. in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll talk about trees. Yeah. <laughs> um, we should do something together, maybe. Yeah. I had the privilege of doing a workshop with Linda once, and it was so interesting because right. a lot of the stuff that she did was like, when, when I was talking about something and she kind of could refer to the research, and it was just such a good workshop working together. I really enjoyed it that. Good. It was good. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah. Chicago next year, we shall see you then. In the meantime, though, thank you very much for your time tonight. It's been an absolutely brilliant uh, conversation, really interesting topics. Um, and again, thank you very much, uh, Linda and Gitta. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.